very happy to have everybody joining us today. Um, yeah, and so for this in session event, we're welcoming uh, Mr. Dave Depper, uh, multi instrumentalist and guitarist of a band you may have heard before, uh, Death Cab for Cutie. They've been on the road, they've been making albums. He's been cooking a lot, gardening a lot, and uh, <laughs> trying to get through this quarantine because we can't be on the road playing music. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, uh, cover a bunch of different topics based on the questionnaire that I sent out to attendees just a little bit ago, uh, just getting some of the content and questions that people were curious to ask Dave. We've gone ahead and put that into a structured uh, interview here based on that content, just to make sure that we're uh, discussing things that people really want to hear about. And then we'll leave it open at the end for 15 minutes, just to make sure that any Q&A coming in throughout the session is taken care of. Uh, definitely can't promise that we'll get to all questions, depending on how many are coming in, but we're going to try our very best. Uh, just a few ground rules before we get started uh, chatting with Dave here. want to make sure that everybody knows that the Q&A function is different from the actual chat function. So as you're posting actually in the chat, you want to ask your questions using the little button down there at the bottom that says Q&A. That way our moderators will be able to actually review the questions, get them to me, and make sure that we're able to ask those questions instead of losing them within the uh, chat. The other really important thing to remember while you're engaging in the chat, we want you to engage. I'll ask a quick question here just to get us started in just a moment. Um, but for those just signing in and typing into the chat, you might see at the very bottom uh, where you type your message, a little blue square just above it, and it says two. So make sure you click on that square and check all panelists and attendees. If you don't have all panelists and attendees checked, we're not going to be able to see your message. The attendees are not going to be able to see your message. It's going to be difficult for everybody to be able to read what you're trying to write. So make sure that the blue box above your message is checked to all panelists and attendees so we can engage. And yeah, I wanted to kick it off, uh, Dave, just asking you, it's, it's quarantine, we're listening to new music. We've got uh, probably a long playlist of music that we're all trying to catch up on. So I wanted mm -hmm. to invite the people joining us to chime in as well in the chat. But uh, I'll kick it off by just asking Dave, what have you been listening to lately? What's been uh, keeping you motivated and positive and grooving through quarantine? Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, it's I'm very happy to be here. So thanks for having me on. And hi to everybody out there. I'm already seeing a lot of international hellos. So hey to everybody in Spain and the Netherlands and Argentina, etc. Good to see you. Um, what have I been listening to? Um, when, when this kicked off, I found myself, um, you know, probably like everyone, rather anxious and unsettled. And, and I found a lot of what I was drawn to was sort of soothing instrumental ambient music, I guess. So a few things that I was listening to heavily in the last month was uh, the new album by Brian Eno and Roger Eno. Most people have heard of Brian Eno, probably famous producer, synthesizer, wizard, artistic music visionary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff. I'll probably talk about him several times this hour. Uh, he has a very talented younger brother who's a, a pianist named Roger Eno, and they've worked together in the past in varying capacities, but they've actually never released uh, a record together uh, under their like dual build to the two of them. And they released a record called Mixing Colors about a month and a half ago, and I've, I was completely obsessed with that. Um, there's a record by... Uh, Japanese sort of new age jazz guitarist guy named Leo Takami. And I have to thank uh, Ben Gibbard for hipping me to this one, but it's called nice. Felis Cactus and Silence. And it is one of the strangest records I've ever heard, but I'm completely addicted to it. It sounds like, like a new age meditation documentary slash video game <laughs> soundtrack with really shredding pretty jazz guitar over the top, all played by this, this Japanese guy, um, and okay. and I'm I'm really loving that record. A little bit uh, of everything mixed into one sounds like. Yeah, it's great. It's in, it's also instrumental. Um, one of my favorite musicians working today, maybe my absolute favorite, is uh, the guy that goes by the name of Caribou, uh, and he his new album, which I'd been looking forward to for years, came out. Uh, I think at the beginning of March or end of February. It's called Suddenly and 
it's almost certainly going to be my favorite record of the year. I cannot stop listening to it. It is the most beautifully produced, layered, heartfelt, wonderful, warm record. And every time I listen to it, I hear something new. Um, so that has been on constant rotation for me. Um, this week, we had a couple sad losses. Uh, uh, Florian Schneider from Kraftwerk passed away yesterday. And uh, Tony Allen, incredible Afrobeat drummer who played with Fela Kuti in the 70s, passed away as well. And so I've, I've kind of had uh, Fela Kuti music and uh, Kraftwerk music on constant repeat the last few days as well. And it's that music's very happy. It's not sad at all. And it's sad to have lost those guys, but they led long, productive lives. And it's just nice to celebrate what they left us with. So right on those right records. On. It's often nice to, even in times where you are grieving or mourning somebody's loss, like the music that they've made, the things that they left behind are really positive and can, you know, keep your spirits up despite the fact it's kind of sad at the same time to listen to those records for sure yeah um and if, any, and if anybody's never heard fella kuti before um go listen to the record aphrodisiac which uh is streaming as far as i know and uh it'll probably blow your mind it's some of the most celebratory rhythmic propulsive joyful music you've ever heard it's awesome he's influenced so many more artists than you would realize too that play today like so many people that i look up to and listen to have mentioned Fela Kuti is a huge influence on their music. So yeah, if, if, you liked, if you like talking heads, like r you remain in light. David Byrne's basically gone on record saying it was his attempt to recreate a Fela Kuti record just with mm -hmm. weirdo white musicians in New York City. And he, he almost pulled it off. Um, but yeah. if you listen to any of those Fela Kuti records from the 70s, remain in light sounds completely different. It, it all, they all of a sudden sound kind of like a cover band with an eccentric lead singer. It, it's great. <laughs> uh, speaking of influences, wanted to dive into the topic of your solo work a little bit. Specifically, mm -hmm. somebody brought up a record that you had made a little while back, um, and it's called The Ram Project. Mm -hmm. So it stands out as a highlight uh, where you re-recorded Paul McCartney's Ram all by yourself in your bedroom back in 2010. So yes. wanted to check in with you there and see if you could share a little bit about your process toward what inspired you to recreate an album like Ram and what was the production process like for you just recording solo and doing a passion project like that? Yeah, um, well, we, we happen to be in the room that I recorded Ram, oh. uh, which it is my spare bedroom. And uh, <laughs> just picture this room with none of this stuff in it. I didn't have anything except one of the guitars that's sitting over there. Um, but I had, I had been, playing music fairly seriously since maybe 2004, 2005. I, I, I had made my way into the Portland music scene and, and done a few national tours in a van and kind of been, been scrapping it pretty constantly for a few years. And I got home from that and I had a few months off. It had been the first time in a long time that I wasn't on tour and I had quit my day job the year before and so I just had this block of time and I didn't really know what to do with myself. And I thought, well, it's, it's kind of ridiculous that I don't know how to record an album at home. Like it's, it's probably time for me to start thinking about doing something solo. I've been playing in all of these bands, supporting other people's music and that's been great, but maybe I'm a solo artist. And the only thing was I didn't, A, I had no idea how to record anything. I had no budget to go into a recording studio to do anything there. And I also wasn't a songwriter yet. I had no idea what kind of music I wanted to, cre to create, what, like if I, if I wrote indie music or country music or synth music or anything. None, I had just no vocabulary of my own. And so I thought it, it, a, a, a fun way to coast past all of these problems would be to record something all by myself. That would be a fun opportunity to like learn the intricacies of recording myself i wouldn't be burdened with writing songs first time out it just seemed like if i was trying to write songs for the first time and record for the first time it was going to be too many things at once and so i started thinking about records that i could possibly record and some seemed too daunting some seemed too simple and i had kind of been obsessed with this paul mccartney album ram for for a while and for those of you who don't know it's his second album after the beatles broke up he 
he, the Beatles broke up and he released an album called McCartney, which is great. And then he recorded this album, Ram. And Ram seemed like an interesting candidate because the songs really run the gamut from very simple acoustic guitar singing and like one keyboard on a couple songs to massive Sgt. Pepper-esque productions with orchestra and, and stuff like that. And so it, I thought, oh, well, this, this is interesting. This will be kind of like a college course that I can be taking myself. I'll start with the easy things and like get, figure out how to make a guitar sound good and how to record my voice and build up. And, you know, a few songs in, there's like drums. I didn't know how to play the drums, but I bought a cheap drum kit and taught myself and I played the drums. And so I, I just learned all these instruments one at a time. I sang lead vocals for the first time. And then by the end, these, the song, I was laying down like, synth horns and synth violins like one <laughs> key at a time to recreate these giant things and it's all i did for a month in this room i lost my mind i i had a beard like this big by the end um but i had i had a, a record at the end and i recorded it all with one microphone and the two guitars that i owned and a, a the one bass i owned and this drum kit and i had um I was using something called an Apogee One interface, which I, people that record probably are familiar with an Apogee Duet. An interface is, the, all it is is something that connects a microphone or an instrument to a computer, because you can't just like plug them in directly. So fancy studios have interfaces with 48 to 96 inputs for all the things at once. So I'm actually talking through one that has 24 inputs right now. but at the time I had this thing that had one input so I can only record one thing at a time. And so this, this album was just pieced together extremely painstakingly that way. But that, that is how it got recorded. Nice. And like what stands out is the hardest part about that whole process. Like what was the one part, whether it was, you know, figuring out the drum kit for the first time or even mm -hmm. just using that one output that stood out to you as learning home recording at the same time recording, you know, a, a full cover album like that. What was one of the most difficult things for you? The drums were very hard to figure out. And um, I did them in, in such a way that uh, it's, it's insane when I think back, but I only had this one mic. And so there was no way to record a drum kit the way you should record a drum kit with the mic on the snare and the, on the cymbals or whatever. So I recorded them one drum at a time. So I <laughs> like held the snare up and I was like, I had RAM, I, I would have the songs like in the uh, digital performer, which is what I was using to record it with. I've, sure. In there, and I would compare like, I'd listen to like 20 seconds of it, listen to like, you know, the drums going, do, do, da, do, do, da, 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 and I'd be like, okay, so that fill is these three drums going, da, 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 da. So on this drum, I'll just go, da, da, da. And then I'd... <laughs> go to the next drum and that drum, the part of the fill would be like, da, 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 da. And I had to just line this up and I didn't know how to, now you can, you know, edit things to make them perfect and, and, you know, line them up in the grid. I didn't know how to do any of that. So I was just over and over. The drums would just take two days alone to do all the drum parts. It was completely, completely crazy. And then the other hard thing, which ended up being super educational was, I, it was really important to me to try and match the tones of everything, like the, the lead guitar parts. Like I really wanted to match whatever stinging lead sound was on this one song or a fuzzy sound on another song or, or like a very compressed clean sound on the other one. But I had no equipment. I had like five pedals and a very rudimentary understanding of plugins and, and uh, recording software. And so... I listen back now and it's, it's, it's pretty embarrassing for me to listen to now because I know how to do all that stuff now. And if I could go back, I could do a much better job of it. But it's, it's the thing I like about it is it is a document of a learning process that was just done in real time. And it's like, I, I have this product that came out of this very particular time in my life and I can hear my uh, evolution and education as a musician and a recording engineer in in an hour of listening to this thing so in yeah, that yeah. sense i'm not embarrassed by it it's just it's just like looking at old photos of yourself <laughs> right that's great it's something to document you know where you can go back to that time and think about where you were you know recording one drum beat at a time and how far you've come from there uh 
And yeah, I mean, it leads to new projects like 2017's Emotional Freedom Technique, your solo mm -hmm. album that came out really well received, really great album. I've been listening to it a lot lately. Thank you. And uh, yeah, really love it. And I'm curious, just because you've spent a lot of time, you know, as uh, even on your website, you're described as the perennial sideman. You know, you've played with a lot of different bands and everybody seems to know you, but you now in the last few years have taken that and started really digging into your own solo work among other projects and bands that you're playing with. And so, you know, from the RAM project to emotional freedom technique and now beyond, uh, over that time period, playing with different bands and, you know, working on projects almost for the sake of learning and getting better, like the RAM project, how did you take that and apply it to what you created with emotional freedom technique? And what's some of your favorite parts of touring that album? <laughs> well, by touring the six shows I ever played on it, <laughs> but we'll get back to that. Um, sorry, record label. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, emotional freedom technique. I, I don't know if this will entirely answer your question, but I'll just I'll just go back to how that got created because it kind of is it kind of jumps off from the Ram project. So I, I finished the Ram project, and that that was an interesting thing for me too because I had zero expectations with that. I did not intend to put it out at all. I, I, I started a Tumblr blog at the time and as I would finish each song, I would share the finished product and like post on Facebook like, hey, I've finished another Ram song. Kind of just as an, an attempt to hold myself accountable so like my friends and my parents could listen and be like, you know, keep going so I, so I wouldn't give up. But strangely, a couple record labels got in touch with me in the in the middle of doing that and they found out about it and they were like, we love this. We'd love to put it out. And which was extremely unexpected. It was totally a private or for my friends and family kind of experiment for myself. So I had never really thought of myself as having any potential for being a solo artist at all. And it, and it all of a sudden I had this record with my name on it, like pressed on vinyl and a PR campaign and I played shows to support it. So, um, about a year later, I, I found myself in kind of a similar situation. I was home for a little bit of time after touring with some other bands. I now had some recording equipment. I now had a couple more instruments. I knew how to record. I knew how to sing. I knew how to do all this stuff. But it hadn't solved the problem of how do I write songs? What kind of musician am I at? Like, like what am I trying to express with, with, with what I'm writing? And I, and I would sit down to try and write and none of it felt honest or worth listening to. It's like the, the first test mm -hmm. for me at least should be like, would I listen to this music? Is this cool? And no, the answer was no. Like, I don't <laughs> like any of this. This is, yeah, it just didn't sound good. So um, I have a really good friend who's an amazing uh, songwriter and author named Nick Jaina, who just came out with a new book called Hitomi, which you should you should buy just letting you know world he's great he um he's kind of this almost guru like figure that sort of has all these in interesting intellectual thought games for anybody that's stuck creatively and he he i was lamenting to him about this this problem of not knowing how to express myself and he said well have you ever tried something called the 20 song game and i said no what is that well it's an insane project that you embark on with three or four friends where you all agree to go home separately to your own spaces and write and record 20 songs in 12 hours. Like write and record 20 songs in 12 hours. And at the end of doing that, you get together and you all listen to each other's songs. So that's, it's just as crazy as it sounds. You, depending on if you eat or smoke or whatever you do, like you have like 30 to 40 minutes per song to write and record it. And it's, it's awful, it's no fun, but it's, what it does is it puts you in this panicked, hyper creative state where n you can't afford to throw out any ideas, like no second guessing, it, it quiets the inner critic. You just have to know that what you're doing is probably bad, but you just need to push through it and do it. And so I, I'm, I did it that day, I made it to 17 songs, I think. I don't know if anybody made it to 20. And most of them were terrible. Like if anyone heard them, I would die. But there were like three songs from that day when we were all listening back to each other's music that made people kind of perk up and go, 
whoa, what's this? And they were all, they were these three kind of synth, sad synth pop songs where they, they were just these very simple kind of nakedly emotional lyrics. And none of the other songs from that day sounded like that. But these three songs did. And it, it was kind of a style that I would have never anticipated writing in. And everyone that day said, hey, man, like, this is very compelling. This sounds like you. And even more importantly, when I listened to it, it felt like me. It felt like an honest thing that I wanted to express. It didn't sound like anybody else. And that ended up being the start of Emotional Freedom Technique. Like two of those songs are on the record almost unchanged. Like I, I, really? wrote, I wrote a bridge to one and, and one of them needed like better lyrics for the second verse or something. And I re-sang them and stuff. But yeah, the, like two of them uh, date to that day. And all of a sudden I sort of had a roadmap for what this album would sound like and what I sounded like. And so the, the record just flowed from there. And that's, that's how that came to be. Wow. I think that's a huge testament to something that I think a lot of songwriters or musicians are really self-conscious of is the ability to be willing to seek feedback from projects that you know might be naked or might be demos or might be still very new in your journey as you know learning your own process as a songwriter like mm -hmm. that's huge had you not participated in that challenge who knows if the album would have ever come to be absolutely yeah um the flip side of that is you do have to believe in yourself and when i i think there is a danger sometimes in sharing something with somebody too early and if their reaction isn't what you want, it can really discourage you in a very unproductive way. Like we, ha we have to remember, we all have very different tastes in music. Like even my closest friends with whom I share an almost, you know, circular Venn diagram of musical interests, there's still things we disagree on and everyone's gonna have their own ideas of the perfect record. And so if you, if you share something with someone, there's a, at least for me, there's a danger of if they're not like, wow, this is the best thing you've done yet. Um, unbelievable. If, if they're just like, yeah, this is good. You know, like, <laughs> I'm like, oh God, like I need to th throw this whole thing away. Definitely. But that said, you do have to realize that you probably are making music that people are gonna hear and you should probably let people hear it at some point and, and not be afraid if their reaction isn't 100% positive. But be willing to, let the reaction guide how you continue, perhaps. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we had a songwriting workshop last week. And one of the biggest things, despite the fact that like, you know, you've got to feel confident in what you're doing, got to feel confident that you've like reached a stopping point where you can share. I think uh, one thing that I took away from that workshop was having a good enough attitude to not being afraid that like nothing is ever quite finished and therefore it cannot be shared. You mm -hmm. have to have that good enough attitude to get it out there and to get the feedback so that it can be finished. So I couldn't um, agree more, yeah. Excessive professionalism is, or perfectionism is paralyzing in, in any Professionalism art. important. <laughs> professionalism but is great. You're right. Perfectionism, great to a point. Gotta be careful, right on. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I mean, that, that brings up my next question actually pretty well, which is all about collaboration. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, playing in all of these different bands and with Death Cab, as well, I, I know you all live in different areas and you know, creating albums requires a lot of what I would imagine remote collaboration as well as meeting with one another and setting that time in the studio. So I wanted to focus more on your experiences remotely collaborating on projects, mm -hmm. whether with mm -hmm. Def Cab or otherwise. Uh, what advice would you give to artists trying to make that work with their own groups or as they meet new artists that they want to work with especially during the lockdown and just in general given we all can't be in the same place at the same time but we want to create together mm -hmm. uh, i would say be comfortable with the equipment you have um but it's also not about the equipment you have like i i know a lot of people that get fixated on the idea that a certain piece of gear or a certain instrument is going to make them sound so much better. And that can be true to a point, but like, like what I did with Ram, like it's not the best sounding thing ever, but I did it with almost nothing. And I just learned how to use those tools really well. And we're in this golden age of information and tutorials online. So if you, if you own a Mac, you have GarageBand. If you have a PC, I'm sure there's a similar equivalent. Like you have 
just about everything you need. Uh, you, you can get an inexpensive microphone, you can get an interface, you just need a, one guitar, whatever your instrument is, a MIDI controller. You can make an entire album entirely in the box without an instrument at all. And I, I would say just like dedicate yourself to really learning that intimately. And then you have, you have so much power at your fingertips to get tracks from somebody and, and add to them and send them back without spending your time worrying about how it works technically. I think mm -hmm. so many people working remotely in their home studios maybe for the first time and you know, by home studio, it could just be your kitchen and a laptop. It's, I, I think when you get frustrated by, oh shoot, I don't remember how to splice this track or, or bounce this thing or, or make this thing sound good. Like get that work out of the way, put in the time to be familiar with what you have and then collaborating is gonna go so much more smoothly, at least on a technical side. Like you can, you can concentrate entirely on creatively what you're attempting to do. Nice. Um, yes, I feel like that only answered one aspect of your question though. Let's, uh, uh, yeah, I guess I can jump more specifically into, mm -hmm. you know, the collaboration process for one of the most recent projects that came out, which is thank you for today, which mm, you okay. contributed to, uh, for Death Cab's newest mm -hmm. album. Uh, so what about your previous experiences working on either your solo projects or projects with friends or other bands help you prepare for the process of making that record with a band like Death Cab. And could we maybe get a little inside look into what that process looked like working with uh, the entire band? Yeah, I'm an open book. Um, cool. Hopefully they're not watching and I don't get sued or something. <laughs> um, we'll keep it on the DL, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I am very thankful that I had the experience that I had in studios before going into that environment because it was very intense to walk into a studio with that band. But I, I, I kind of had a very organic history with what I did in studios starting in like the mid, mid aughts with the bands I joined in Portland. It was, there was never this big pressure moment of like the recording studio with the producer and the clock is ticking and money is going down the bathtub drain. Because I was just, I, I, was, I was fortunate enough to be in a band called Norfolk and Western in the mid aughts, which was kind of, kind of had a little buzz going at the time. But our singer owned this wonderful recording studio in Portland called Type Foundry that everyone from the Decemberists to M Ward to like Spoon have recorded in. But at, at the time, it was kind of just this very low key, beautiful space. And we, I, I could just, we would go in there whenever he didn't have anything else booked and could stay there like all night long. And so I kind of learned the ins and outs of the recording studio in this very natural, um, low pressure way. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I recorded so many records in there with so many people over the next like seven or eight years. And so when I've done sessions with other people, I've kind of like gotten it down to knowing what I need. Like I don't really need to know the particulars of the studio, but I need to know how to get any sort of sound that people are, are looking for rather fast. And so that's jumping, I guess, to the mid period between like those early days and Death Cab where I did a lot of sessions on bass or guitar or keyboards. And the RAM project, fits in perfectly with that. That, that, that was kind of the first case where I was really interested in how to recreate classic sounds and bass tones and guitar tones and things like that. And so I, I very quickly realized that when you, when you go to a session, sure, they want what you're bringing of yourself, but they also have a sound in mind too, and they might not know how to articulate it. And as a session musician, it's your job to realize that sound for them, even if they don't know what they're talking about. So you might be doing something and the part is great, but they're like, oh, it just, it's a little, you know, inarticulate and dark. And you have to know what that means. Like, okay, do I brighten up my bass tone with the knobs on my bass, with a pedal? Is it on the amp? With guitar, it's like they might find a certain distortion sound piercing. Like, does that mean you change the pedal? Does that mean you change the guitar? That sort of thing. And so I had a, a several years of sort of fine tuning that process and, and being able to sort of dial up sounds quickly. And then fast forward to Death Cab, uh, it, is a, it is a band of hyper-skilled, 
hyper experienced musicians with zero patience. <laughs> like every, every, everyone in that band is like, things need to happen now. And like, like yeah. if you're, if you are wasting your time fiddling around with something like they, they're, you're going to be left on the side of the road face down in a ditch. <laughs> no, no slight on them. It's, it's made me a much better musician, but I had to walk into that studio knowing exactly what I was doing. And for the first time, also inserting myself into this established band with a very established sound that had a, a, a hole in the shape of their former guitarist who had his own distinct sound and figuring out how I could partially fill that hole, respect the sound of the band by like sort of not recreating his sound, but nodding to his sound at times, but also bringing my own sound and influence to the table. And so mm -hmm. um, to, having to hit the ground running doing that from day one was, was pretty intimidating. Yeah, definitely sounds like it. Uh, yes. Death Cab with that mob mentality. If you <laughs> <laughs> don't have your shit together, you're going to kick you out. Uh, yeah. But it was, but, um, it was, uh, it, it was wild. It was, it was very intense. It was the, it was like, okay, here we are in Santa Monica, California with a Grammy winning famous producer and the pressure's on. It's the first album with this new lineup. And is it going to be any good? We don't know. Is it going to still sound like the band or the fans going to like it? And we're here sure. for three months. Like, um, so I, I never had a, a full on super pro intense experience quite like that before. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, I guess I can just go into it. It was, sure. Uh, yeah. it was, um, it was an interesting time because at that point I had been in the band for three years touring that, uh, the record Kintsugi. So that record was the second to last record by the band. Chris Walla gave his, you know, two weeks notice while mm -hmm. recording the album, basically said, I'm going to finish the record with you guys. I'm going to play the, the remaining shows we have on the docket and then I'm out of here. Um, I will not be touring on the record. And so uh, I and my bandmate Zach were approached sort of as they were finishing that record. And it was a very unique situation that I'm not, I'm not familiar with it happening very often where someone records a record with the band and then leaves and then somebody else has to tour it. And, but Zach and I were brought in to, to do that. And so that was an incredibly intimidating experience in, it, in and of itself. And I having to learn basically entire catalog of this band in two months and, you know, touring the world, being the new guys. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I, I saw you guys at Chicago theater in 2015. Yeah, that was, that was an early show. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It was great show and we, we were kind of in groove band but uh they were leading up to stepping on stage with them for the first time were a few of the most nerve-wracking months of my life just like can can i do this i don't know if i can do this but yeah i did it and it, it went well so by the end of those three years of touring kintsugi and playing festivals and stuff like i felt quite comfortable being in the band being the guy that goes on stage and plays guitar and sings the backing vocals and that sort of thing but the prospect of collaborating in the studio as, as a ostensibly equal partner was, was a whole different thing. It's like we, we, we had to kind of, it kind of dialed things back to zero in terms of what our relationship was like. Like it wasn't the live show anymore. It was like, okay, like you three guys have made Grammy nominated gold selling records together for years. And Zach and I have never worked with you before what what is my role am i allowed to say if i don't like a song am i allowed to say if like hey that bass part's good but what if it did this what if what if they don't like what i'm doing do i like which happened a lot like i did lots of things they didn't like and i <laughs> it doesn't feel good and and i had to really learn to check my ego and figure out like am i serving the song here am i just upset cuz i'm not on this song enough mm -hmm. 
what's really important here? The th important thing is the song. It's the important thing is for it to sound like the band and it doesn't need to be cluttered up. And I just, I just learned so many lessons like that that I'm still learning to this day with, with those guys. But yeah, um, there were, there were good days, there were bad days, but uh, overall, like I really loved the record we made and it, it was just kind of a crazy thing to wrap it up and hear it mixed and it sounded gigantic and huge and yeah. pro and, and, and like Death Cab for Cutie, this band that I'd been listening to since college. And all of a right. sudden, like I was playing guitar on it. It was <laughs> very trippy. That's awesome. Man. Yeah. yeah, and like everything you said, the good days and the bad, that seems to be the best way to, in a situation like that, where a band is reshuffling the order of people contributing to the music, you have to build that chemistry. You have to have those good days and those bad days in order to get the kind of record that you made, which is a brilliant record. So congrats oh, you. on that. You guys you guys found the light at the end of the tunnel there. Uh, yeah, we did. Um, it, and, it was, uh, oh, I was just going to jump ahead, ahead to yeah. um, early last year, we recorded uh, a few songs for this thing we put out called the Blue EP that fans mm -hmm. of the band might know. And it was so interesting to come into it uh, with without the pressure of recording Thank You for Today, like, we did it. We pulled it off. We made a record that sounds like Death Cab and it didn't like torpedo the band and we we <laughs> we toured and people came. Like we we did we can do this, you know. And just going in with these two songs with no real pressure, uh, a different producer that no one had worked with before and it was just so comfortable and all of a sudden we had this dialogue between the five of us in kind of a common language without the like, well, you know, I, I don't know, I, I should be extra polite to Ben, or maybe he's being extra polite to me, but he, he doesn't really like what I'm doing, I don't know. It was just like, I love what you're doing, or I don't like what you're doing, try something else. It was, it, it was just so much more comfortable and easy, and um, I, I can't wait to start work on the next real album whenever we're all allowed to be in a room together again. <laughs> I think we're all excited for that, right on. Uh, and that, that brings me to a lot of the gear that you're surrounded by right here. Wanted to talk a little bit on that before we start taking some questions that are coming in. Just a reminder to everybody tuning in, uh, if you have any questions for Dave that you'd like asked, I can't promise we'll get to them all, but we've got a few questions coming in and use that Q&A function at the bottom of the screen in order to ask a few questions. We'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can. But yeah, first- I just, I just realized it's 40 after, that's crazy. We're flying oh. by, yeah. All right, okay. Usually that's how these things go. So I've got mm. to keep an eye on the time, but really enjoying this, Dave. And want to talk a little bit about your gear setup. Uh, okay. The people, the people have asked, so we need to know. Uh, what does your main live rig consist of with guitars and effects? And can you take us through some of your favorite pieces of gear, maybe how they've influenced your sound or what you want to achieve on stage or in the studio? Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, starting with the live setup, uh, we have kind of a funny thing that we started doing on this last tour, but it's worked really well. And uh, some people will not like what I'm about to say, but um, <laughs> Zach and Ben and I, all switched to using something called a fractal axe effects system instead of using an amp. So it's mm -hmm. this rack mounted amp simulation thing um, that you can kind of go as deep with as you want. Like it, it has, it, it, they've modeled something like a thousand amplifiers in it. If you want a 1962 brown face fender or an 80s Marshall stack or whatever, it, it sounds exactly like that and we've just found that live we have so much more control over the sound and our front of house mixing guy is able to have a much more consistent sound from night to night by using these these things on stage it's not the sexiest answer ever but we 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 did the whole kintsugi tour all analog all amps Amps break a lot. They doing doing 150 shows a year. Like the amount of time we'd spend switching out tubes or having amps go down in the middle of the show or whatever, it was a it was actually it was a real problem. And since switching over to these things, it sounds really good. They no one can tell the difference, and it's just so much more pro and consistent sounding from night to night. You can still play all of your pedals into them. They sound totally amazing. Um, so that's what we've been doing live amp wise and sounds like a science fiction, uh, 
tool. These the days, fractal X affects like two that. plus. Yeah, it's exactly, it's it's yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> um, re- recording wise, uh, we the amount of amps and gear we had in the studio in LA for Thank You for Jay was was pretty incredible. And I can't even remember what amp I used most of the time, other than I did use a, a Roland JC20 a lot to play through for that nice. wonderful chorus sound. Um, behind me, I have a, a Prince, pardon, I'm drinking this Topo Chico and it, you know, it's the bubbles are intense. <laughs> um, I, I have a Princeton Reverb and a, a, a Roland JC77 behind me. And those are kind of my two home workhorse amps that I also love recording with. They're small, they don't get too loud, they sound great. Um, Live, before switching over to the Fractal, I was using a Dr. Z Maz 38, which is kind of a beautiful combination between almost like a a Vox AC30 and a Marshall kind of sound together. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, those are kind of the amps that I use the most, I would say. Any favorite um, guitars there standing out? There's a few people have commented on the beautiful color of all those guitars. So. Well, thank you. Yes. So um, live with Death Cab, I use a guitar that looks like this. Um, if you've seen us, you've probably, be, probably seen me playing an orange version of this. You definitely saw that at the Chicago Theater. Um, it is by a company called Fano, um, and the model is the PX6. Man, and what I amazing. <laughs> it's totally amazing. It's pink. Uh, it's great. Uh, so it's the thing I love about it is uh, when I joined the band, there were just so many <clears throat> get to, like types of guitar sounds over over eight albums that uh, it's it was very hard to cover without imagining taking like ten guitars on the road like chimey Rickenbacker sound to like a Les Paul sound to to strats and stuff. And so I, I, I searched around a lot. I, I took a lot of guitars out on that first tour and then I discovered these guitars which have um, Lawler Firebird pickups in them which are mini humbuckers. And something about the combination of this guitar and these pickups, you depending on how you have the them set and how the tone is, like it can cover a very chimey clean strat sound but it can the bridge pickup with some overdrive on it sounds it can just sound like an overdriven sg or a les paul really quickly it's like this very beautiful compromise between humbuckers and single coils and then the necks are incredible it looks ridiculous i guess (laughs) um so i have like five of these Uh, i have like a two pink ones an orange one a blue one and um Maybe I just have four, but yeah. So this this is like my main workhorse guitar and I use it on everything. Um, nice. So that's that. Beautiful. You probably picked the best color. I'm not going to lie. So <laughs> um, my favorite guitar I own though is this. Uh, it is a Les Paul Special in TV Yellow. And I got it when I was 13 years old. This is like my second guitar I ever had. Like I, I had a, a PV, like a hundred dollar Strat copy that my parents got me when they were like, all right, well, let's see if this kid like is actually going to learn guitar. Sure. <laughs> and after about a year, I, I like proved my dedication and they, they, I really wanted a Les Paul. I was like very obsessed with Robert Fripp and he played a, a Les Paul and I had to have a Les Paul. Well, real Les Pauls are like $2,500 to $4,000, but Les Paul specials, cheaper this was eight hundred dollars and my parents agreed to go halvesies on it with me for my birthday or something and so when i was 13 i I worked at the coffee shop or something while there weren't child labor laws since i'm I'm a million years old and um we we split on this guitar and i this was the only guitar i had from like age 13 to 26 or something i did the ram project with this guitar and it's always it's always felt very special but I didn't, I didn't always, I didn't take this guitar seriously because it was like, I got, I got it as a teenager, whatever. But I've since gone back and if you read nerdy guitar forums, they're like, oh, if you got a Les Paul special in 93 or 94, you got the deal of the century. It's a world-class guitar for 800 bucks. And this is one Whoa. of those guitars where just for a couple of years, they were using really high quality components and something about the wood and the construction just makes them into a world-class guitar. So I've since played this guitar on The Tonight Show and 
like <laughs> Ellen and stuff. And I, I just love that I'm sort of, uh, I, I'm celebrating this teenage, you know, this toy from when I was 13. It's this great thing. Like if you look yeah. at my high school yearbook, there's pictures of me playing this guitar and I still use it. It's on Thank You For Today. Um, so yeah, this, this is the one thing that I would, I would rescue from a fire other than my cat. So, <laughs> and it's the epitome of they don't make it like they used to kind of guitar. Absolutely. Sounds like. Speaking of, um, this guitar is super cool. It's a, it's a 1969 Mustang that, um, if anybody out there is a fan of the Vaselines, like, like Kurt Cobain was since Nirvana <laughs> covered Vaseline songs on, uh, MTV Unplugged. We were touring in Scotland and a, a mutual friend put me in touch with Eugene Kelly from the Vaselines. I, I, I put the word out that I wanted to stay in Glasgow for a few days after we got done touring. Mm -hmm. And he offered me a couch and I ended up staying with Eugene Kelly for five wow. days or something. And towards the end of the trip, he was like, hey, you're looking to buy a guitar? And I was, <laughs> I was like, well, uh, yeah, I am actually. And he was like, oh, I'm trying to get rid of some of my old stuff. And he, uh, he had this incredible Mustang. And like, I looked, I looked him up on YouTube and there's like pictures of him on TV or videos of him playing this on TV yeah. shows and stuff in the nineties. And he sold it to me and it's, it's this amazing guitar. Um, a relic at this point. <laughs> super relic. Yeah. So this, this is like probably the coolest guitar I have at my house right now. Um, Beautiful. a bunch of the guitars that I have are, in death cab world, like in locked away in cases, cause we were supposed to be on tour um, at this time. And so all of our gear is kind of like in go mode, mm. waiting, waiting to be released. So like my orange guitar and the cool Rickenbacker I have and, and stuff are, are locked away. I would love to show you them right now, but unfortunately I can't. Um, hey, when we're all, when we're all back to it, we'll, We'll grab them tickets and check out those live that live rig for ourselves. Yeah, there you go. Um, just two more that are really great. I've used these both with Death Cab a lot. Um, this is another Fano, uh, another model of theirs that's kind of, it sort of has the same specs as an Epiphone Casino. It's got is that P90s like in it. blue? Yeah, I think Sonic nice. Blue is the like official name, but yeah. And Sonic Blue. I used this heavily on the Kintsugi tour. I always played the song Transatlanticism on it. Uh, it's, it's an amazing guitar that I just decided not to take out this year because I wanted it at home to record with. And so thank goodness I did because I can't get to my other guitars um, right. right now. And uh, this is by a company in Iowa called Built, B-I-L-T. And uh, it is so cool. The, mo the model is Zaftig. It has uh, Lawler Imperial humbuckers in it, which are these incredible, chimey, super like Les Paul sounding humbuckers, mastery bridge, but then the, the electronics of a jazz master. It's this just crazy Frankenstein guitar. And then it's a semi hollow body as well. And you can get a, a rainbow of tones out of it. It's super playable. I love this thing and I'm, I record with it all the time. I love the neck on that. That's gorgeous. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, it's awesome. They're a great company, too. So, super fun to work with. Same, same with Fano. Two very small, very, very cool companies with people in the business for the right reasons. So I'm going to put you've, these down. You've, ins you've inspired me to get more musicians on in session just to do an MTV Cribs style review of their home recording setups here. <laughs> just run through all the guitars uh, for an hour straight here. I'm going to try and get to just a few questions that have come sure. through. Uh, first and foremost, you know, you mentioned uh, you use one of your guitars there to play on Transatlanticism. One mm -hmm. of my favorite songs by Death Cab, I actually had the opportunity to bring my wife and I to another theater in Chicago, not the Chicago theater, but it just so happened to be the anniversary of the record being released. And you all kind of surprised the crowd. Oh, you were at that show. In its entirety. I was there. Yeah. The Pretty Auditorium intense. Theater. The auditorium theater is gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. And we were blown away. Transatlanticism, easily my favorite record mm. by the group. And uh, it was a really special moment getting to see that play live in its entirety. Wanted to ask, uh, just because it's come through a few times, uh, what is your favorite Death Cab song to listen to? What's your favorite Death Cab song to play while you're on the road? Uh, my favorite Death Cab song to play is Transatlanticism. Um, right on. More than anything, every every single Death Cab show, I still 
And I've played like 300 now, which is nuts. And I've been in the band for almost six years, which is also nuts. But You're kidding me. God, time flies. Crazy. Yeah, I've been in it way longer than I was in high school, um, <laughs> which seemed like 20 years long, you know? So um, I still have pinch me moments every night of playing with them, which I'm grateful for. That It hasn't become a chore or a treadmill or anything like that. And any job, the luster wears off. It's just the nature of things. But we close every show for the most part with the song transatlanticism and i play that like birdie, birdie riff yeah and every night when i play that i'm like i can't believe i'm playing this song i look <laughs> down at my hands and i'm like this song that i listened to so many times as a young man that hadn't even played like a serious show yet with anybody listening to this band like man, they're great. I would love to be in a band like that someday. And and getting to have that experience every night is still so special for me. And then that song is just an incredible song that's sort of unlike any other song with like the, it's so slow and it's almost like, it's almost like a Godspeed You Black Emperor song or something like, yeah, like this yeah. build, like it's just, it's, it's, it's a post-rock kind of thing. And then the release at the end, Every time we play it, you look down and everyone in the crowd is like doing that come on thing at the end. <laughs> it feels like yeah, a religious revival. Out. People That's freak awesome. out, yeah. yeah. And people are crying and like sometimes I cry. And, and, and then the whole point of the song is by the end, you're just going as hard as you can. Like I've, mm -hmm. I have blood, actually, if, you, if I hold this guitar up again, I don't know if you can see, but there's blood splattered on it. Oh yeah. Um, the last show I played, because I often cut my finger open on transatlanticism because I'm just like wailing on it. <laughs> um, Literal blood, sweat, and tears gone into that song. Yeah. So that song just had it so on so many levels, it's it's very moving for me for all of those reasons and and and, and more too. So that's my favorite to play. Um favorite to listen to. I'm I don't know if I have like a favorite. So well, hmm. What Sarah said might be my favorite Death Cab song, um, just because it is so evocative and moving. And like, as I get older and parents get older and other people's parents pass away, it's it just seems to be more poignant every time I hear it. And when we play it, it, it people are really profoundly moved, and I see a spectrum of emotions every night. So I, I oh, love man. playing that one too, but to, to listen to at home, that's that's a very meaningful song for me, I would say. Especially right now, I, I've been catching some of Ben's live sessions at home and he played that mm -hmm. one on piano a few weeks back and it, it struck me in a much different way given the climate we're living in right now. Just, yeah, it's, it's great how even as life changes for better or worse in your day-to-day -day situation, music can still be interpreted in different ways based on how you're feeling, based on where you're at in life. And that's one of those songs that's really changed and carried with me as I've listened to it going into college. And now, you know, as a grown man, it, it still holds a lot of meaning, but in a lot of different ways as you get older. Yeah. Yeah. At like the best music. And, and I think that's one of Ben's greatest strengths is he writes these songs that seem so specific like that has very specific details about the smell of the hospital room and all that stuff, but they, they do evolve and change as you get older. And he sings songs that he wrote when he was 21 years old and we play those songs, but they still work in, in, in a way that isn't embarrassing. Like I think a lot of, I couldn't say that of every songwriter, probably a lot of songwriters feel very embarrassed by songs they wrote when they were 21, but his stand the test of time and like, and age really well. And so I, I really look up to him for that and, and like want to know the secret to it. But that's why he's Ben Gibbard and we're not. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Can't hold a candle yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but wanted to ask too, you know, you've built such an incredible career and you've contributed to so much in, I mean, music in Pacific Northwest, but also, I mean, all over the place, just throughout your tenure. And Wanted to ask a question that came in uh, from Christina, who's in the audience here. What advice do you have for artists that are trying to balance all of these different responsibilities with studio and touring and maybe even regular work day job to support, you know, the projects that they're working on uh, while also trying to develop? You know, if you could go back and give yourself some advice to 
face the responsibilities ahead of you and balancing all of these different things that you now know how to do so well, what would you say? Hmm. Well, luckily we don't have to balancing the touring part right now, so we can. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> we, can, we can cut that out of the equation. Um, I mean, the overarching advice before getting into the specific specifics of that is like, make, make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. Like, <clears throat> I think if you go into it expecting any outcome, especially now, but but it's always been true, it's not going to turn out the way you think. You, if, if you go in like with big dreams, even if those big dreams come true, they won't come true in the way you expect them to, to come true. And they probably won't come true. To like the, the odds of like getting to where what seems like the ideal are so remote and I don't say that to be a downer, but I say that to, to, to be like, you should do this cause you love it and you should do it knowing that no matter what happens, you're going to keep doing it. Like what, no matter what the outcome, like do it because it's coming from within you. Like I, I would say that everything that's come for, for me, like the various milestones in my career, none of them have happened when I've been like gunning for it. It's like fate can smell that on you. It's like when you're trying to date, whenever you want to meet somebody, you don't. But the second you're like, well, fuck it. I'm, I'm, I don't care. That's when you meet, you know, your next long-term relationship partner. So, so beyond, beyond anything, just make sure that you're doing something that feels honest to yourself in terms of, in terms of balancing everything don't don't spread yourself too thin i guess like figure out what you feel naturally good at and concentrate on that and that's something that i wish that i had done a better job of i guess if i was to go back i i think i had an, a natural ability to be good at a lot of things um early on and that gave me this false sense of confidence that I was good at all of those things. Whereas I, I didn't put in the time to excel at any of those things. And while in some ways I think my career has been the product of being reasonably good at a lot of things, it's, it's held me back that I, I didn't concentrate on any of those things. Like I'm, I'm still like unlearning really basic guitar mistakes. Like if you knew some of the, some of the picking errors I make or fingering errors I make it, uh, I, I'm sure that people that play guitar that are watching this, many of you are much more accomplished guitarists than I am. And I'm just good at playing one on TV or something, or I've figured out what works for me. But I, I wish that I'd really put in the time to like sit down with a teacher. Like I, I taught myself, I was like, Oh, I can do this. I don't need, I don't need to listen to anybody. I don't need to, to figure out how to do this the right way. And it got me to a certain point, but I've never been able to progress past that point. And I've tried so hard and I'm, I'm realizing now at 39 years old, I, I need to take guitar lessons. And annoyingly, I can't. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll find a Zoom person or something like that. But I, I wish I'd taken voice lessons instead of like damaging my voice at a lot of shows or not being able to sing the way I'd like to sing. I wish that even though winging it in the studio and learning things that way was fun, I wish I had like sat down with a book and really learned about the frequency spectrum and what frequency drums sound muddy at and how to make voices cut through mixes without chopping too many high end frequencies off, blah, 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 that kind of thing. All this to say is like, do, do the work, like sit down and be a student of this thing you're trying to do. Right. It's so fun. And it feels so instinctual that I, it can lull you into thinking like, well, I, the artistic thing to do is to just follow your muse. And yes, do follow that muse. Absolutely. But it doesn't hurt to like learn how to do it the right way. And I wish I had, I had learned to do things the right way a, a, a little more often in my past. Taking that raw talent and sharpening those skills to, you know, build a toolbox that contributes to that raw talent, I think is one of the most important things any artist or creator can do. So thank you for that advice. That's really great, Dave. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. This has been so fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. I can't believe the hour's up already. Uh, 
thank you to everybody who submitted questions. Uh, I apologize we didn't get to everybody's questions, but uh, plenty of good stuff in here. We'll be sharing this recording after the fact. So if you want to rewatch it, catch some of those album recommendations at the beginning, uh, feel free. And yeah, we'll, we'll be posting this up next week. But Dave just wanted to take a second to thank you again for your time. And uh, is there anything, any last words, anything to promote, anything to share before we uh, wrap up here? <laughs> um, I, don't even, I don't know if I need to promote anything. I'm working on some stuff. It'll be announced when it's time to be announced. But um, right on. I, I would just say, like, we didn't even get to talking about pedals and stuff. And so if anybody uh, wants to, like, tweet at me or... I'll maybe I'll put up an Instagram questionnaire or something, but I think the more important stuff is what we talked about, like the full buying stuff and being confident in yourself um, is and doing things for the right reason. I think is more important than than any any gear you have or in any of the right people or anything. Just be follow follow the path that feels true to you and put in the work to make sure you're on that path correctly and always be nice that's okay there that's the advice i'm going to leave you with <laughs> no matter how talented you are no matter how good you are there is always going to be someone better than you no matter what it doesn't matter who you are and if it comes down if 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 there's a gig that you're trying to get or or, or trying to get someone to come to your show if it comes down to you and your equivalent or someone that's a little better, people are going to go with the person they like more. People are going to go with the person that is kind. People are going to go with the person that they want to ride in a van with for 14 hours a day, every day for a month. So be that person. Be that kind person. There's so much unkindness right now that uh, just don't add to that. And especially if you want to make it in a, a very harsh industry, be kind. Be the person that people want to spend time with, and you will you will find success with that. That's what I would like to say. You catch more flies with honey, right? There, yay! There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the kind, the humble, the very talented Dave Depper. One more time, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Uh, be kind to one another. Be good to one another. This is in session, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Everybody, take care. Bye. Bye.